we're relaxed about sharing. We're not, you know, we don't think we're going to take over the world, and actually, this is because of pressure on budgets in many cases. So I think I don't, I don't, I don't read a sort of colonial uh, threat or or even a sort of narrative into into that at all. It's the perception from the other side that I was talking about. If, for example, you decided that in North Africa, France should lead the way and have a single embassy. But you wouldn't have that. You wouldn't have France leading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're, we're, I mean, yes. we're all uh, intelligent people here. You, you wouldn't, that's exactly the sort of thing that you wouldn't do. And it would be, uh, and, and I w in those areas where there is a historical connection, uh, that member state, be it France, be it the Netherlands, be it the UK, be it Portugal, I doubt would give up its embassy in, in you know, those um, countries in the world where it had been uh, more present. Uh, so I don't think you'd see that happen. Okay. Um, I have been looking over there. I'm not neglecting anyone on that side. No, gentlemen there in the red tie. Uh, yes, Ian Bond from the Centre for European Reform. I think all of the members of the panel were pretty dismissive of the idea of extending QMV for um, CFSP. And one of the, the criticisms that's levelled at CFSP is that it's always the lowest common denominator. And uh, you know, it seems that in some ways not having QMV, having to have consensus, makes it easier to keep reducing it to the low, lowest common denominator. So I'd like to ask the, the members of the panel, if you don't go down the, the, the QMV route, is there some other way in which you can make it harder for an individual member state with a hobby horse, whether that's you know, the name of its neighbours or whatever, um, to keep blocking otherwise sensible approaches to policy? I think you've put your finger on a very difficult problem. Uh, but I mean, I remember you know, one or two people um, suggesting at the time in May 2010 when Greece got its bailout, perhaps we should use this occasion to say to the Greeks, we're not going to bail you out unless you drop this nonsense about Macedonia. <laughs> but I think that, that to, to, to do that sort of direct linkage and direct pressure would raise enormous problems for, for some countries. I mean, they, they do, they, they're not just playing a game. They believe this is a very, very strong interest, as Cyprus does in relation to Turkey. Um, in a different sense, and um, I, I just think if you say to people, you're either going to put immense pressure on them, or you're actually going to outvote them, you're asking for them to get very resentful to the whole European Union, and it's, I don't think we're ready for it. What I was hinting at, but I agree it's a rather ineffectual way forward, is that somehow or other you can try to persuade certain countries, including in this particular example, Greece, that it's in their own long-term long interests if they actually are a bit more flexible about some of these things. But the British are not very made for being flexible on issues either. Does that kind of mean happen already? I've suggested the British law not flexible, but I find it quite <laughs> strong. <laughs> 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 I'd say that. Um, and behind the scenes, there must be attempts to persuade people. Well, I mean, consensus has had to be built. Mm. Uh, and you know, a lot of this is about building consensus. There, there are occasionally awkward member states, as you know, of particular <coughs> including policy towards Russia, um, which, you know, to some extent, one has to attempt to get around. And Cyprus has been, Cyprus and Turkey between them, been blocking much more sensible uh, cooperation between NATO and the EU for a very long time. Um, again, uh, it would be wonderful to get over that. The, the domestic politics of those two countries of it um, block it. Um, and I go around um, the European Union saying, you may uh, all think that British domestic policy is difficult, but just look at some of the others, including your own. Um, everyone's got their own blocks and their own hang ups. Um, and um, that's one of the reasons why quite a lot of cold foreign policy has to be built by groups working together. Uh, not necessarily all member states being involved in every single activity, even though we spend a lot of time saying to countries that only look east, you should look south, and countries that only look south, you should also look east, etc. As we go on, trying to explain to quite a lot who haven't really thought about it, why the better matters. Is there a better way, Emma, now that you've got no. the European Union to 27? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the there simple, just isn't. The simple answer is. Is no, there is no short uh, cut, there is no clever way around it. 
if you're going to have a common foreign policy, it has to be common. It has to be agreed by all 27 member states. In the last round of treaty negotiations, our government, and I was an advisor in that government, uh, was very strong about making sure that this was, you know, that this method of unanimity was kept in foreign policy, and we were not the only government who wanted to make sure that was the case. So, um, as Lord Wallace has said, if you can't get a consensus on a particular conflict, on a particular issue, sometimes you have to have smaller groups of member states, as, as was the case in Libya, actually. I mean, you know, why don't you Libya, formalise that, then? Why not have, why not have a two-tier euro for it? Because it's not EU... I mean, I, I just think that the principle of EU common foreign policy is that you all have to agree. The EU cannot act in the name of 10 out of 27 member states, or even 20 out of 27 member states. That goes against the grain of EU foreign policy. If you're going to do something else, it has to be outside of the EU. Because, as you said, in, in terms of your first question, Sophie, this is such a sensitive area. The EU cannot act on behalf of less than all of its members in this area. It won't happen. Do you agree with that? Or, I mean, even I do. No, I do. I, I don't even though you can have some people who share common currency, no, you can have some people who share um, past I think this is, this is not the same as the single market. In the single market, clearly, a decision was reached, although some people feel unhappy with it today. The decision well, was reached that, for example, the decision was reached that you wouldn't make any progress in the single market unless you have a majority voting, which actually was in the treaties to start with, but then it was slightly kiboshed by General de Gaulle. Um, uh, I think foreign policy is seems a much more sensitive area than the question of um, you know, milk quotas or something like that. And you can't impose a foreign policy on a country that doesn't agree with it. But I mean, one recent example that, that I thought showed that countries do attach increasing importance to Europe acting together was the question of, of the Palestinian Authority at the United Nations, where I think I'm right <coughs> the Czech Republic abstained. You probably remember better than, than I do. Now. Or was it the other way around, or voting against? Um, we, we, to, we, came very, we came quite close to a composition. We tried extremely hard well, to achieve a composition <laughs> and were unable to do so. I thought there was, a, there, was a, there, was a, there was an attempt by the Europeans to act pretty much together on this. There, there was a question. very active attempt and until 24 hours before we thought we had got a composition, but domestic politics pulled different countries in different directions. Uh, Aram Argaryan, Embassy of Armenia. Uh, in fairy tales, when there is a situation when you want to send uh, somebody to a no return mission, usually it was said, you know, go, don't know where, get, don't know why. So, and, and uh, basically, uh, don't you think that this discussion that we are having, I mean, we are having, discussing something that we do not know what it is, and uh, the aim is that we do not know what kind of aim what we want to achieve, because as uh, 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 Madame uh, Prime Minister said that uh, when she was trying to uh, put me what are the what are the failures uh, to get the foreign co common foreign and security policy was that so far you didn't manage to prioritize the objectives where you want to focus, but. If it's, it's when you speak about the foreign common foreign policy, isn't it uh, an over confidence? Should wouldn't it be much better if you, like uh, like uh, Madame uh, Prime Minister suggested, maybe to try small steps to prioritize to select an objective and try to work on that, and only once you succeed and then come and build something wider that you could come up and tell it that it's the common foreign and security policy. Is that Which you build, you build a common foreign policy in stages. We have actually quite a lot of achievements to our credit. John Peters talked about the long and very painful process of dealing with the Western Balkans, um, which still has some way to go. <coughs> um, the Europeans have worked together um, very carefully uh, over the last 20 years on the Western Balkans. Um, what we're doing on Burma now is new. Um, usefully done, putting together the common interests of a number of different European states and the resources which they have. Uh, a number of European governments haven't really thought about Burma before. It's quite a long way 
okay, but you know, there's something useful we can do. In between, really major issues, foreign policy towards Russia, foreign policy towards China, the Chinese are very much trying to split major EU countries at the present moment. Now, of course, those are the most difficult, but also the most important. And there is a great deal of regular consultation at all levels about those. And the common policy towards the South Caucasus, well, again, some countries are more interested in the South Caucasus than others. Um, as you know, there have been three British ministerial visits to Armenia in the last year, and another one is coming up very shortly. Um, some other countries are, are less engaged. Uh, so we, we build it bit by bit, um, and actually we have done, I think, fairly well over the last 20 years, but this is a slow process, and it's step by step. We are out of time, very nearly, I'm afraid. I'm just going to ask our panelists to give us their final thoughts on how future um, pan-European problems are going to be. How long have we got? Um, well, firstly, we've got to stay in the European Union, how we've all said this. Let me state the feeling obvious. Uh, I'm going to go on Sky News and have a row uh, with the Tory and the Tory about this. I think the row will probably be between the Tory and the Tory, but there we go. And then I'm on private grief. I think the idea that the UK should stand apart from what is actually putting the Eurozone on one side, the most successful regionalised uh, cooperation body in the world, uh, and I know it's not easy to say that, but it is has been successful in many regards in a way that other uh, regional blocs have not yet seen success. ASEAN in Southeast Asia and Mercosur in Latin America are looking at our single market with envy. Our single market in goods is one of the, well, it is the best single market in the world in goods, not quite there in services. So uh, we shouldn't be shy about our successes, even if the Eurozone the euro has not been the great success that many uh, wanted it to be, but there's still time for the eurozone to get its house in order. I think it will be necessary for that to happen, for the EU to punch its weight and above its weight in the world, and I think it will be necessary for the UK, given that the UK and France are such leading members of the EU in this area, uh, to remain in, in this